Are you an overeater? So sometimes you open up the bag of chips and you think you're only going to have a handful and you end up eating the entire packet. I know I do. I go down to the, the shop to the uh, Bristol Farm store sometimes on Sunset Boulevard and I get a bag of barbecue flavored pop chips and I say to myself, I'm only going to have half now and I have the half in a couple of days and most of the time I've got the bag finished by the time I get home to my apartment. <laughs> I am an overeater. Uh, a lot of the times I overeat on very healthy food. Um, rarely do I overeat on bad food, but I am an overeater nonetheless. And today we're going to figure out how to stop that habit. How do you stop overeating? And then when you do overeat, how do you recover from binges? Do you have an addiction to food? And even if you don't, do you sometimes know that you eat too much? Well, we're going to figure out why, how to stop it and how to recover from it. With with that, it's a big welcome to a veteran psychologist who has decades of research in why people binge and overeat from stress. He's been on the, featured in the LA and New York Times. He's been on TV shows across the country. He's the author of Never Binge Again. His name is Dr. Glenn Livingston, and he joins us from Pembroke, New Hampshire. How are you, Dr. Livingston? I'm very good, and I'm looking forward to talking to you. Thanks, James. Wonderful. Great to have you here. Um, I, today, I had a huge lunch. I had, albeit a very healthy lunch, I had some arugula and some kale and I had a couple of potatoes and then I finished it and then I decided to go a second round and I went another round again. And uh, I felt pretty, pretty good at the end. But is that, is that binge eating? If, does it count if you're eating super healthy foods that you know to be healthy? Well... One of the things that I've discovered is that it, it's really critical for people to step back and define for themselves what's binge eating and what's not binge eating. Because there, there's so many variables and most people who would identify themselves as an overeater or a binge eater, they've done a lot of studying about what's healthy. And you could ask them, have you had better days than others? There were some days where you felt like you ate just about perfectly, and what happened in that day? What, you know, how, how, how many portions did you have, and how frequently did you eat, and what specific, specifically did you have, and why did you feel proud of that, and how did your body feel? Right? And my, my, there's so many different diets out there, and there's so much different information about what constitutes healthy versus unhealthy food. I, I don't really get into that. I have very different opinions about it, but I don't really get into that with people because I find that most people know for themselves what's healthy and what's not. And I, what I tell people is that it's extraordinarily helpful if you take these four categories of behavior, of eating behavior, um, things that you never do, things that you do only under certain conditions, things that you always do and things that you can do in an unrestricted amount and define your food plan. So um, kind of going to what you were talking about, I work with a woman who figured out that the best way to control volume for her was to say, I always take a 60 second pause before I go back for seconds and I get up from the table and take a deep breath. And that's all she really needed to do to figure out what was she really hungry? Was this something that she mindfully wanted for herself? Or was it something that was a little more compulsive and mindless? And, you know, that type of a rule in her always category really worked well for her. Um, there are other people who need to eliminate certain foods. There, there are, certainly for me, I'll, I'll speak for myself, it's kind of like I've got an inner chocolate monster, right? Mm -hmm. And that, that chocolate monster will tell me anything to get me to have chocolate. It. Um, I remember there was a time when I, would, I was on a, I was trying to follow, follow a diet that had an awful lot of vegetables in it. And, you know, I had the Monday morning, I'm, I'm a formerly obese guy, by the way, I was about 60 pounds. Yeah, we'll, year, get it, we'll, we'll get into your story in just a second, but yeah, yeah, yeah. carry on. Yeah. Um, but I, I remember a time when I was going to, uh, I, I was going to, try to eat an awful lot of vegetables and I was going to stop having chocolate and candy and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and I was walking up to the counter on Monday morning after making this resolution and I was waiting to pay for my Starbucks and there was this big hairy chocolate bar that's just staring at me and saying, you know, you really want me. And all of a sudden I hear this little inner voice saying, you know, Glenn, 
chocolate, it comes from a cocoa bean and, and cocoa beans, they come from a plant and a plant is a vegetable. So, you know, chocolate's really a vegetable. And of course that's ridiculous, but I, I, I use it as an illustration because during the moment of impulse, we don't typically have access to our higher levels of cognitive reasoning and impulse control, right? When there's that temptation, what happens is our survival drive has been hijacked and we think that we need that chocolate bar to live. And because of that, there are some foods that it's easier to say never to than sometimes. Just because if you, if you look at a food and say, well, that's, that's not really food to me, um, that's a much easier decision than, well, gee, did I do enough exercise to have a bar of chocolate and am I up to my chocolate quarter for the right. day? And there, there are just some foods that people can't, that, that some people need to say never to. And there's some people who could make a conditional rule and say, you know, I can have chocolate on the weekends or I can have chocolate at social events or I can have chocolate once a month on the weekends and it really works fine for them. So what I like to do is take people through an evaluation of the different trouble foods and behaviors that they have and also of the different constructive um, foods and behaviors they want to implement like drinking more water or having more vegetables or going for a run every day or something like that yeah so i uh i'll, I'll give i'll just give you a rundown of when i get tempted and when i overeat and, and then I'd, I'd love to ask you a little bit about your story and why this is such a fascinating topic for you as i understand that you uh were an obese child or maybe you you were obese at some point in your life and now you're reformed and have found the way so looking forward to exploring that but for me personally i'll tell you I, uh, I've always eaten a huge amount of food and I'll tell you where I think it stems from. I remember back in the early eighties and, uh, about 1984, 1985. And I remember sitting at the, the family kitchen, uh, family table, dining room table, and my mother serving us our dinner with me and my two younger brothers, Edward and Tristan and my father, Ron. And if I didn't eat all of my plate of food and if, if I le had leftovers, for example, my mother would say, James, finish your meal. Think about all of the starving children in Ethiopia. <laughs> because at the, at the time, it was this huge big thing, like all the children in Ethiopia were starving of hunger. And you might remember like we are the world and we are the children and sure. Michael Jackson and all those famous 80s rockers came together for the Live Aid concert and to make that very famous song. And so for a couple of years there, it was just huge about the famine that was going on in, in Africa and Ethiopia. And so from that moment on, whenever there was a meal, even if I was full, I would always finish my meal because think about the starving children in Ethiopia who would love <laughs> to have just a little bit of that. So I always just from that moment on ate everything that was put in front of me and more. <laughs> like even when I was finished, if I saw food around, I would just keep reaching for it. So I have always had a huge appetite compared to what I, what society might deem as, as normal. Um, now I'm quite fit and quite healthy. Like I consider myself to be a fit and healthy 40 year old. I'm quite lean. Um, I've never, I mean, there was a time where I quit playing rugby when I first came, when a couple of years after moving to America and I stopped exercising for a year or two, I started drinking a little bit more and I started eating poorly and I blew out to about 218 pounds. I'm now 185. Um, but that was really the only time that stretch when, uh, I put on a lot of weight and it I think it was because I didn't do the exercise because now I can't, I don't think I've, I've eaten, I'm eating any less right now. Um, I think maybe what's happened is I'm now choosing better foods and I'm exercising considerably more. So anyway, that's just to give you an overview, Dr. Livingston of, of my eating habits and why I think. Uh, it stemmed from that. Is that a logical uh, summary, do you think, or, or theory as to why maybe I've, I've always overeaten? It's, it's a logical theory as to how you got trained to overeat. Right. Um, and, and by the way, some of the things that I say are really not in concert with my profession's view of the psychology of eating. So I I actually operate in this venue more as a coach and an educator than a psychologist. I have a psychological degree, but um, I, when I work with people, I work with them as a coach so that I'm freer to say things that my profession might disagree with. Um, but my, what, what I want to tell you about that, James, is that the fact that you were trained like that 
it doesn't require you to overeat. It, it creates a certain discomfort if you don't. It, it creates a certain psychological experience that makes it um, more natural for you to overeat than not overeat, but it doesn't really require you to overeat. And what I tell people is that you, um, you, you can draw these lines for yourself. And when you draw these lines and you adjust your behavior to match these lines, then the psychologist, it, it becomes something very interesting and soulful to look into. You know, my, my mom was married to an army captain and she was very worried he was gonna go to Vietnam and get killed. And she was overwhelmed because her father was missing when I was first born. And so she, rather than putting an awful lot of time into you know, feeding me, this was 1964, so they didn't know as much about child rearing back then as they do now. Um, but she, she would keep a big bottle of Bosco in the refrigerator on a very low level. It's Bosco is this chocolate sauce. And all she would say if I would cry or I was hungry, she'd say, well, the Bosco is right there. And so I, that's psychologically where my addiction to chocolate probably came from. But what, while I could use that as a jumping off point to talk for a few hours soulfully about my upbringing and what it means for the rest of my life, it, it doesn't have that much to do with whether I stop eating or, or, or not. Um, what, I, what I tell people to do is to draw this line in the sand. Um, for, instance, for instance, I, I will never have chocolate again. Suppose I say that. Um, and then any thought whatsoever that suggests that you have to have chocolate or that you have to overeat because of the starving children in Ethiopia, you consider that to be coming from your uh, destructive self or your inner fat thinker, or in a shorthand, I call my inner fat thinker my pig. Some people get upset with that. They like to call it their inner slacker or they have all kinds of names for it. But but it's um, this entity that I want to separate from. And so what I say is that, well, it doesn't matter why I crave the chocolate. To me, chocolate is not food. Chocolate is something the pig wants. Chocolate is pig slop and I don't eat pig slop and I don't let farming animals tell me what to do. Um, and it's not a lot more complicated than that to just keep separating from those thoughts and um, allocating them to your inner pig or your inner fat thinker. And then if you want to, it can be helpful to come up with a rational answer to what your pig is saying. So for example, when your inner pig says, or your inner fat thinker says, you know, you've got to finish everything in your plate because of the starving children in Ethiopia, Ethiopia, you could say, well, no, I have to take care of myself in the best way possible so that I have as much energy and enthusiasm and passion to help the children in Ethiopia and do good things for the world. I can't be lethargic and you know, unhealthy and die an early death because there are going to be more starving kids if that's my mission in life, right? Now, you don't have to have that answer. It's enough to know that, that the um, suggestion and desire to overeat is coming from the pig or your inner slacker or whatever it is. But it can be helpful to come up with a cognitive reason um, to overcome that so that you kind of more, more thoroughly put the pig in its cage around those those ideas. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, so let's talk about some, well, first of all, just to give us a little overview about what your story was. You said that you were, you uh, had obesity or binge eating as when you were younger. So what's your story? Mm -hmm. um, I, I was born in a family of psychologists. There's 17 of us all together. Now I have my mom and my dad and my sister and my cousins and my uncles and my grandparents and you, you don't want to come to my family reunions. There was an awful lot of talk about psychology in my, in my family. Mm -hmm. um, and I sometimes joke that I can't do anything around the house except for ask the broken stuff how it feels. <laughs> but but um, I was what you would call an exercise bulimic. I discovered probably around the sixth grade that if I exercised a lot and I loved to work out that I could eat whatever I wanted to and not gain weight. So I was actually a relatively thin child and teenager. What happened was that as I was kind of nearing the end of graduate school and taking on responsibilities, seeing, seeing patients, having a wife, having a house, so all of the responsibilities of adulthood, I couldn't find two or three hours a day to exercise as much as I wanted to and still be an adult. 
but I found it very difficult to stop eating all the things that I was eating. I, I was the kind of guy that could dislodge my jaw, go to the delicatessen and tell them to empty it into me. Um, and I just really, really enjoyed that. And I found it extraordinarily difficult to stop, to stop. And I just kept gaining weight and went through some stressful times. And then I gained more weight and my triglycerides, I think the highest they were, were about 1100. Um, ridiculously high number where the doctors would yell at me and say, you're going to be dead by the time you're 30 if you keep this up. And, um, but I, I literally felt like I couldn't stop. I, you know, I went to support groups. I went to psychologists. I, I naturally gravitated towards all of these psychological elements because of my background. And I even set up a, um, a very large online study. We had over 40,000 people participate to look at the relationship between personality and particular food addictions. And I, I learned some interesting things. I learned that people that really crave chocolate are feeling lonely or unloved in some way. And people that crave um, carbohydrates are usually feeling very stressed. And people that crave salty chips and things are feeling some type of uh, work anxiety. So I want to go, I want to go over that. That's interesting. So people who crave chocolate are, uh, are feeling unloved. Is that right? People who crave carbohydrates are feeling what? People who crave chocolate are generally feeling unloved or lonely. Okay. People who feel who are craving carbohydrates are feeling stressed. And people who are craving chips tend to be feeling um, anxious. Oh. Tend to be feeling anxious. So every time I go for a bag of pop chips, I'm feeling anxious. All right, I'll have to make sure I check, <laughs> check my mood next time. <laughs> yeah, there weren't perfect correlations. At, but here, here's the thing, James. The thing was that I thought that knowing that, I could then go to someone who said that they were craving chips and I could help them work with their anxiety and I could come up with alternative coping mechanisms and help them, you know, figure out how to get through the day feeling less anxious. Mm. And I thought that they were going to stop having chips then. What happened was they learned some of these anxiety coping sessions because they said, you know what? until I really figure out these coping me mechanisms, I'm just going to keep having as many chips as I want to. See, there was that inner voice that was always rationalizing why it was okay to have the industrial hyper, hyper, hyper palatable food that they were addicted to. And, and eventually when I came across a, there's a body of literature by a man named Jack Trimpey and rational recovery and a couple of associated people. And they talk more about this voice inside of you that you need to deal with. They, they also deal more with the black and white addiction, like, you know, you can stop doing drugs, you can stop having alcohol entirely, and it's perfectly fine for you physically, you can't stop eating entirely. So there are a lot of differences in terms of applying something like this to a complex behavioral system. But at bottom, um, the, the key insight for me was that there's this crazy voice inside of me that, inside of people, that says, we can't survive without this addictive food. We can't survive without the chocolate. We can't survive without the second or third portion of X, Y, or Z. And that's what I had people, that's what I had to teach people and teach myself to, to deal with. Okay. So let's come up with some practical ways here on how we can avoid or we can prevent that. So can we get, have a few examples? Let's just put it into um, context here. Someone who's listening knows that at a certain time of the day, they want a Kit Kat or a bag of Skittles from the machine. Or they know at the end of the day, they want, uh, at the end of their meal, they go, oh, I really want some Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Mm -hmm. Even though they're full. Well, we, I could do this one of two ways. I could speculate on that hypothetical person, or if you want to, I could coach you through a specific example. Which would you prefer? Let's go through the example. Okay, I'm just gonna, gonna get a pen and paper so I can take a couple of notes while we talk, do you mind? Go for it. Okay, so what I ask people to do is to think of one specific problem, one specific eating problem that they'd like to conquer because it's easier to learn this technique when you're working on one problem than if you're trying to get it, your whole diet under control all at once. Okay. So is, is there one thing that you really wish you could um, do better with your, with your eating or eating behavior? With, uh, with me? Um, okay. It would be uh, eating 
the large quantity of ice cream after a meal that I tend to eat on weekends. So on a Friday night or a Friday night or a Saturday night, I will have a big meal. And then I think, oh, it's Friday or Saturday. I'm going to have half a tub, which might turn into three quarters of a tub of sugary ice cream. Sounds good. Um, Bloody delicious, i got to tell you. <laughs> What's your favorite flavor? I'm a caramel kind of guy. So I love caramel. There's a, there's a, I think it's Ben and Jerry's. There's like a caramel cone. So it's got little bits of chunky caramel plus some waffle, waffle cone in there. I think it's Ben and Jerry's. Bloody hell, that's, that's amazing. I mean, that is sensational. I, I challenge anyone not to be able to, like once you open that lid, not to, not to want to finish the whole damn tub. But there are billions of dollars of research spent on making those things. Oh amazing. yeah, there's a there's a famous book called Salt, Sugar, Fat. When uh, and it goes into like they all they have these laboratories of the big food makers, food manufacturers who who hire the world's top scientists to find what they call the sweet spot. So it's like that texture and the just amount of uh, level of sugar and sweetness to make you wanting to just keep keep eating it. Cool. Okay. So when, what, what's the impact of having three quarters of a tub of ice cream on you? How, how does that affect your life? Well, in, the mo in that moment, it's wonderful. It's like pure pleasure. I love it. I love every bite. Um, uh, uh, 30 minutes afterwards, it's kind of like regret that I ate so much of it. It's not regret that I had some of it, but it's regret that I had a lot of it. And then when I wake up in the morning, the next day, I absolutely will go and exercise because I had the, the, the ice cream before, which is a good thing because it makes me go and exercise. But I'm also very conscious so the next morning where I go, oh, I had that ice cream last night. I best go and burn it off on an empty stomach. What, what would you consider to be a healthier relationship with the, with the ice cream? How, how would you, if you could wave a wand and have perfect control, what would you like to do? Uh, I'd like to enjoy having the ice cream on occasion, a couple nights per week, and just be be satisfied with a considerably smaller quantity. The issue is, is that I never seem to be satisfied with the small quantity. What what um, what type of a quantity would you like to be satisfied with? Oh, I think think a couple of scoops. I think I think two scoops would be nice. Is that enough? No, I want it all, <laughs> Dr. Livingston. Of course it's not enough. <laughs> uh, well, but I want the... it to be enough. I want to feel like it's enough. But no, I want the whole damn tub. <laughs> well, so they, they're, it's almost like there's two of you inside, right? There, there's the part of you that has um, goals and aspirations and would like to see yourself behave in a particular way. And then there's this inner pig that wants the whole damn tub. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm spending a little extra time in here on really defining what the difference is, because it's, it's clear that this is not something you want to give up entirely. You, you want to have ice cream in your life. Um, and you want to have enough to feel satisfied. But, but by the same token, you want to draw a line that um, protects your goals and aspirations and, you know, higher level thinking. So mm -hmm. I'm just asking you to double check is, is that, is two scoops, two scoops, that's where that line would be? I mean, if I could find, if I could find a way to be absolutely satisfied, then yeah, two scoops would be, would be, would be sufficient. How could you do that? How could you feel absolutely satisfied with two scoops? Only make two scoops available, available to me. Like if it wasn't, if it didn't come in a bigger tub, it was just a two scoop container then I would create the visual of that's enough. That's what a container is. So that's what I'm going to eat. That's what I'm going to eat. So, so if you put two scoops in your bowl and you maybe enjoyed it a little more slowly or a little more mindfully, um, and you knew that that was all you had, then you wouldn't be thinking about that third scoop. No, okay. no, I wouldn't be. Yeah. Okay. If I knew that was all there was, then, then I would certainly enjoy and savor what I had considerably more. The moment that I put two scoops in and then put the rest of it in the freezer and say, ah, you know, that's all I'm going to have is the moment that as soon as the two scoops are over, I go back to the freezer and have the rest. How frequently would you like to have those two scoops? At least, uh, weekly. Weekly would be, would be sufficient. One night a week would be great. <laughs> yeah. And forgive me for being relentless about the definition. I, I want to set it up so that your, your pig can't fool you. 
um, when you say one night a week, is that like a calendar week from Sunday to Saturday? Is it only on the weekends? What? Yeah, it's usually on a Friday night or a, or, or a Saturday, Saturday night. Okay. Mm -hmm. One night per weekend. Yeah. On, on Friday or Saturday. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And so uh, this is a, I'm just templating this for your audience so they know how to do it themselves. We're eliminating any ambiguity because the pig loves ambiguity at the moment of impulse. It looks for little holes in the fabric of your plan and it just rips right through it. So we're, we're really eliminating any ambiguity. And then we're gonna make some very declarative, bold statements. And this, this is the part that's controversial because if you talk to most people about anything addictive, they'll say, you know, you really can't, you really can't do these things forever. You can just, you can make a guideline more than a rule. Um, but I, I think that when people are setting out to accomplish something important, like climb a, a mountain or ride, ride a bike all the way to the top of the hill if you're a little kid, I think that they need a way to purge all the doubt and insecurity from their mind. I think they need to be able to visualize the top of the mountain and see themselves finishing it. I, I think they need to know they're gonna pump their legs all the way up the hill. Now, if they happen not to make it, that's another story, then they should be kind to themselves and we're not gonna beat ourselves up and we're just gonna get back up and do it again. But it's, it's kind of like when you get married, you don't say, you know, I'm 80% sure that I can not sleep with anyone else, but there sure are a lot of attractive people out there. So I'll just make that a guideline, not a rule. Um, and so I ask people if they would be willing to consider making a very definitive rule for themselves, like I will never have more than one and two scoops of ice cream per week, per calendar week, and I will only ever have ice cream on one weekend night again. So that would be the most, I'm just writing these down so we can come back to it. That would be the most definitive and declarative statement I could come up with to encapsulate the rule that you want to follow. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm covering a lot of ground here because I know we have a short amount of time. I would normally do this in a longer example and I can point people to some examples on my site if they want to, to listen to that later. Um, just before we go on, we're talking to Dr. Glenn Livingston, uh, who is a, a trained psychologist and has helped thousands of clients uh, over the years. Where can our listener find more about you as we continue here, Dr. Livingston? Well, my, my book is available for free if you go over to neverbingeagain.com. Neverbingeagain.com. So there you go, neverbingeagain.com. If you are a binge eater, you want to rein in how much you eat, check out neverbingeagain.com. All right, continue. And I should say that's the, the electronic versions of the book are available for free. The paperback and the audio version have a small charge associated with them. Okay, so we've got two rules to encapsulate the behavior you want. I will never have more than two, scri two scoops of ice cream per calendar week again, and I will only ever have ice cream on one night, on one weekend night again. And I would normally add between now and the day that I die. Why would I do that? I know, I know that this is gonna engender all sorts of feelings inside of you and you probably hear your pig screaming right now saying between now and the day that I die, whoa, whoa, Dr. Glenn, I don't know if I really wanna do that. Um, but that's on purpose. I'm really, we're really trying to force the pig to the surface. I just want you to ignore it for the moment. And what I wanna ask you is if you never had more than two scoops of ice cream on one weekend night, again, between now and the day that you died, and you did this perfectly for the next year, what, what would be different in your life? How would your life have changed a year from now if you were able to do this 100%, regardless of whether your pig says you can or you can't? How would my life change if I only have two scoops of ice cream per week for the next year? Yeah, you suddenly have this magical ability to do that. Uh, I'd probably feel, um, I would feel more, self-control which would give me a feeling of satisfaction i feel like i would probably be slightly leaner 
physically, which would make me, which would create more energy, which would make me happier. And I would probably savor the ice cream. Um, you know, I would appreciate the ice cream more when I actually, ha when I actually had it, knowing that it was only once per week. Okay. Um, what would be the impact of having more energy and being happier? How, how would that play out in your life? Uh, having more energy would make me, uh, give me greater clarity and having greater clarity would give me more direction. Having more direction would make me happier and being happier would probably make me, uh, wealthier and making me wealthier would probably give me a greater level of satisfaction and yeah, it would have spin off or spin off effect. Could I press you to just be a little more specific about that? So um, what would you do with all the clarity and energy and um, happiness that would create wealth and how much more wealth do you think you would have because of this? Well, it would enable me to focus more on my business and to be more focused in the moment. And the more focused I have, the more knowledge I will be able to gain. And the more knowledge I'll be able to gain, the more I'll be able to implement new strategies into my business and create new products and so forth. Is there a particular project that you feel you'd be able to move forward better? Uh, yeah, I'd be able to move my 30 day no alcohol challenge forward more. In fact, what I would learn from abstaining, I guess, for the other six days of the week from ice cream, I'd be able to teach to the existing customers and new customers of the 30 day no alcohol challenge as it relates to alcohol and as it relates to other areas of their life. The more, I'm able, more I'm able to serve them, the more they're going to want to work with me and that would equate to more members or longer staying members, which would mean more dollars in the pocket and greater levels of satisfaction from being able to help more people. And James, would this impact any of your personal relationships? Well, if I was, if I, I guess if I was happier, then sure, I would be, I would attract even happier people into my life. Okay. I, I would spend a lot more time on this if we were doing a full mm -hmm. session. What, I, what I'm really doing is trying to ground you in your higher aspirations and goals associated with the desired behavior change. That's what I'm trying to do there. Mm. And now what I want to do is give your pig a chance. I want to give your pig a chance to tell you why you can't do this, why you shouldn't do this, why you won't be able to do this. And as your pig is starting to come out, I want you to know, James, I, I like you very much, but I don't like your pig. So um, please don't take anything that I say to your pig personally, okay? Okay. So what, what does your pig have to say here? Why, why can't you do this? Why shouldn't you do this? Why won't you do this? I just like that damn ice cream too much. And sometimes I just, uh, the heart wants what the heart wants and the heart might really want the ice cream on a Tuesday afternoon when I'm pissed off or frustrated at something to do with work. I might just want to go and smash a Cornetto ice cream from the Chevron gas station down the road. <laughs> okay. You know exactly where it comes from. Um, the heart wants with the heart wants. Okay, too fresh to work. What else? Why can't you do it? Why won't you do it? Why shouldn't you do it? Um, because life is too short. And if I want that damn ice cream, I'm going to eat the bloody ice cream because I might get hit by a bus tomorrow and, and I'll be pissed off that I didn't eat more ice cream because it gave me a, it gave me a pleasure. <laughs> That's funny. What else? Um, uh, um, because I've, uh, because I can convince myself that I've seen studies that say that anything that gives you short term pleasure is good for long term pleasure. So I can convince myself that having the ice cream gives me an immediate boost of, uh, of happiness, which would, uh, yeah, I can always find a way to, to justify why it's, it's okay for me to have that. Uh, I'd also want to eat it, I guess, when I was, uh, uh, yeah, with someone else, like someone that I loved or someone that I was close to and I, I would feel like I could have it to bond over. Maybe I was having a nice romantic meal and at the end of the meal, I wanted to continue the romance and have like a little sort of naughty, delicious delight at the end just to, just to uh, round off the evening so I could justify it that like in order to create greater connection, indulging in something that 
is a little naughty and you know that it's bad for you creates intimacy or romance. And so I could justify it that way. Mm -hmm. What else? Um, what's the question again? Well, what, why else does your pig say that you can't do this, shouldn't do this, won't do this, won't be able to do it? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, because uh, I can do whatever I want, whenever I want. I've got freedom. I'm just going to do whatever the hell I want. I'm, I create my own world. No one's going to tell me what I can't do. I'm just going to do it. Okay. And again, if we had a full session, I would keep going to get every last possible, we call these pig squeals, um, every last possible reason that your pig says you won't be able to do this. But what I'd like to do with you now is have you jump back into your higher self, um, the James that wants the energy and happiness and additional wealth and sense of mastery and control. And let's just go through the squeals that your pig threw out at us and see if you can come up with a, um, a counter reason, a reason to, to stay on it. So it's too good and the heart wants what the heart wants. What, what would you say to that? Um, so I, now I'm coming at the count, I'm, I'm countering the argument. Is that right, Dr. Livingston? Yeah, now, now, you're, now you're telling yourself why are you gonna keep to this rule regardless? You're right, the heart does want what the heart wants and what I want more than the temporary pleasure of the ice cream is uh, long-term health and happiness. And so that I overrides my uh, illusionary temporary feeling of pleasure from eating the ice cream. Right. What if you're too frustrated at work? You just want to pound one down from the gas station down the road. Well, just get up and breathe in for a minute. Do some heavy breathing, jump up and down, do some push-ups, do some burpees, go for a walk around the block, drink a nice tall glass of ice cold water. There's 101,000 different things that you can do other than walking down to the Chevron and buying a King Cone ice cream. Yep, there you go. Life is way too short. What if you get hit by a bus tomorrow? You're going to be pissed off that you didn't have the ice cream. Yeah, life is way too short. That's why I enjoy life now by being healthy and energetic and fit and making good dietary choices because I enjoy eating healthy and feeling amazing and enjoying my life. Life is short, so I'm going to make sure that I do it the proper way and that's being super healthy most of the time. What about the fact that you've seen studies that suggest short-term pleasure increases long-term pleasure? Yeah, well, there's always a study for an every other study, isn't there? So, yeah. if it, so I'll just choose which study serves me better in the long term, which is the study that sugar is not good for you. And even a little bit over a long time can make you put on weight, um, give you acne, slow you down, make you eat, make you crave sugar, even more sugary foods, disrupt your sleep patterns. So I'll just go with the studies that show that, uh, you know, having a little bit of ice cream is okay. Having anything in moderation is fine, but anything consistently or overindulging in something is ultimately going to be bad for you. What about the fact that you want to have some type of social enjoyment if you're having a romantic meal with someone to have that indulgence as a way to increase the intimacy? I mean, you can, do, you can do it another way. You can, first of all, you can have healthy ice cream, coconut, <laughs> coconut, uh, based ice cream. You can have um, uh, some fruit, a little bit of fruit. You can do anything else. So you don't even, you don't have to have the ice cream. You can just say something nice or go for a walk around the block or instead of having the ice cream, say, let's go for a romantic walk instead. Or uh, there's 101,000 different things that you can do to create intimacy or connection other than eating a sugary treat. Yeah. There you go. What about them? I, I have the freedom to do whatever the hell I damn want. I know, I do. So I, so I have the freedom to choose what to put into my mouth and what I don't. So I choose long-term health and satisfaction over short-term satisfaction with feeling of resentment or uh, disappointment afterwards. So James, how confident are you at this point that you're never gonna have more than two scoops of ice cream uh, per calendar week and you're never gonna have it more than one weekend night per week? Well, the fact that I'm saying this in a public setting like this is that I'm pretty 
pretty confident. I, let's, let's say this. I'm more confident than what I was when we started doing this. Mm -hmm. So I, have, I understand the process of reframing my mind. I'm not going to say something that I'll regret later and promise it. And then someone takes a video of me smashing a full tub of ice cream <laughs> and posts it on Twitter or Facebook and says, you see, you were full of shit, James. But so I, no, this, is, this is a really, really important point. Uh -huh. This is how what I'm suggesting is different than the way most people go about this. See, um, at this point, what we want to do is separate how confident you feel from what your pig thinks, right? Okay. And we, we it's, it's almost arbitrary, but we draw a line and we say, we're 100% confident that we're going to do this, but our pig has other ideas, mm -hmm. right? And you don't, uh, it's, it's different when you do it publicly. It's different when you do it publicly because then you've got other people's opinions to contend with. And I don't normally recommend that people go about that because I think that nobody can really follow you around all day long and watch what you put in your mouth. So I think that eating is a very private matter and you have to make the decisions yourself. But what I would ask most people at this point was whether they'd be willing to say that they're hundred percent confident and their pig has other ideas because that sets up the framework for hearing all the pig's other ideas. See, if, if, if you're not willing to say you've got that 100% confidence, then the pig can sneak ideas past you. You can think that it's your idea. Um, and it's, it's a very personal choice. I mean, you don't, you don't have to do that. They, the best we can do is give you a real, a real jolt of clarity and determination. Um, but if you really want to take this to the nth degree, then you say, I'm 100% I'm confident, my pig has other ideas, and all those other ideas are pig squeal, I'm going to listen really carefully for the pig squeal, and I'm never going to do it again. Is the, is the way, only way to become 100% confident that you're not going to do it again to associate so much pain around what it is that you're trying to stop? Because I, 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 can, I can probably admit that I don't have that much pain around the fact that I eat too much ice cream on a Friday yeah. or Saturday yeah. night. Like it's not a, I'm not in, with my head in my hands on a Saturday morning going, Oh, James, you're such a fuck up. Like you're a disgrace. Oh God. I'm not filled with self-loathing because I have the tub of ice cream. It's like a guilty pleasure, which I kind of like giggled a little bit about, even though I'm like, Oh geez, I had that. I had that ice cream last night. Well, so, th this might not be something you want to commit to then. It's, it's, um, it's not the only way. If you really wanted to make the commitment, you could. But I'm certainly not going to tell you that you have to do that. And I don't want to take that guilty pleasure away from you. I, I think it's kind of like um, if you were a city planner, you don't want to put more stop signs or stoplights in the city than you need to because it's just going to slow yeah. down traffic. So, so would someone... Uh, see, see I, so really, for, for someone like me who doesn't... Have, feel a lot of pain over binge eating. For me, my desire to to change or my likelihood of changing is not is never going to be as great as someone who puts a lot of pain, a lot of suffering about the fact. Because there might be someone listening right now who's who knows they're overweight and knows they eat too much and feels a lot of pain and hurt around that, and they're more likely to say, "I 100% commit to this," because the pain is just so so great. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's absolutely true. And a lot of the people that my work appeals to are people like me who've been through the experience of feeling um, a loss of control and feeling like it interferes with everything else in your life. Yes. Like it, it overtakes your life. It takes three days to recover. And what's yes. the point? I really liked the, the, the process that you went through there, Dr. Livingston, of, of, identifying like the, the, the positive things that would happen if you were able to control whatever it is that you're trying to control, but mm -hmm. not just like, Oh, I'd feel better or I'd lose weight. <laughs> it's well, what are the benefits you get from losing weight? Cause losing weight is just a feature, right? It's just something that would happen, but a benefit is you are happier, which attracts happier people into your life which makes you more energetic, which makes you look better, which makes you smile more. And when you smile more, 
other people smile at you more, which brings much more positive people into your life and much more positive people into your life will inspire you to quit that crappy job that you're in and finally achieve the dreams that you want to achieve, including traveling the world and building a business and finding your perfect partner and loving your children and having great relationships and blah, 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 blah. They're benefits. Yes. And when you really analyze it, um, if you, I, I think you know that I have a strong background in marketing also. You go from, the, um, go from the feature, which is losing weight, to a rational benefit, which is, um, you know, well, I'll feel better about myself or I'll look better, to, to an emotional benefit, which is that I'll feel happier and attract more, um, attract happier, better, more positive people. And then it kind of develops a constellation of emotional benefits, which is a statement of character. It's the kind of person that I'd like to see myself as. And that's what I'm trying to get people to envision is how they would be a different person and what would that mean for every aspect of their life if they could be that person. Yes. And uh, obviously you're, uh, you know, you've are you written books on this as it relates to food and it's neverbingeagain.com. But can we use this same structure? Can we use this same kind of like investigative questioning designed to extract certain answers for other things like giving up smoking, giving up drinking, giving up porn, giving up a swearing, uh, swearing, um, preventing, uh, getting into fights, being irritated. Like it, does it work in all areas of life, Dr. Livingston? It, it does with a caveat. Um, there's a difference between the black and white addictions like drinking and alcohol where you can give those things up entirely and the more complex behavioral economics like eating or swearing or wh where there are conditions and situations where there's like an infinite number of permutations you have to examine. And I tell people my approach is more forgiving than something like rational recovery or, or the other types of um, cognitive approaches to to the black and white addictions. And if you're struggling with alcohol or cigarettes, then I would encourage you not to use my approach for it to go back to the original work and look at um, you know, rational recovery. I, I don't know much about your approach in particular, um, so I don't mean to steer people towards them if this is something you would like to have them look at your 30 day alcohol free challenge with. Um, but I, what I don't want people to do is to apply never binge again to drugs and alcohol in particular because the mechanisms of forgiveness will ruin the work in drugs and alcohol, um, whereas they help it in overeating. And the consequences are really grave if you ruin the work in alcohol or drugs. So I'm, I'm very careful about that. Well, Dr. Glenn Lemison, thank you so much for your time and for your insight into that. I really appreciate that. Remember to the listener and the viewer, you can check out neverbingeagain.com. Where can we find you on social media, Dr. Livingston? Uh, if you go to neverbingeagain.com, there are links to the Twitter and Facebook and, uh, well, just Twitter and Facebook. <laughs> but, yeah, that's where you find Do you know what your Twitter, Twitter and uh, Facebook handle? It's Never Binge Again. Yeah. Never Binge Again. Okay, wonderful. So yeah, if you want to uh, send him a tweet, send Dr. Livingston a tweet at, at Never Binge Again or follow him on Facebook at, at Never Binge Again, please do so. Send us a tweet right now. Make sure you include at James Swanick there. Um, to let Are we me, live? To let me know that you have listened to me. And uh, yeah, tell us what you thought about, uh, tell us what you thought about this, uh, this episode and how you are going to use what Dr. Livingston taught you in your own life. Are you going to now reduce the amount of ice cream that you eat like me? Are you going to stop eating bags of chips and Cornell ice creams? Are you going to stop drinking so much Coke or soda? Have you got the tools now to be able to do that following Dr. Livingston's advice? And if you'd like to get more and follow Dr. Livingston a little bit more closely, make sure you check out Never Binge Again. Dot com. Dr. Livingston, thank you so much for your time, sir. I appreciate it. Sure. Oh, I, I should say that when you go to neverbingeagain.com, there are a bunch of free food plan starter templates. So you can see examples of what worked for other people. And there are a whole bunch of audio recordings of the um, full sessions like I started to do with James here. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. So if you want to hear even more sessions of that, check out Never Binge Again. Thank you, Dr. Livingston. Appreciate your time.
Thank you, James. Thanks for being a good guinea pig. <laughs> and to the listener and the viewer, thank you very much. And I'll catch you on the next one.